su autora es Isabel Ramírez, conocida como La Muchacha. En esta canción nosotros vamos a encontrar que ella dice A continuación, eh, damos paso a la mesa 3 con el evento académico e internacional alrededor de los estudios semióticos. Damos paso a la mesa titulada Semiótica de los Nuevos Lenguajes. Contamos con la presencia del doctor del magíster Carl Winston Jones con su intervención Descolonizar la Publicidad y el postdoctor Bruno Pompeo con su intervención La Naturaleza Semiótica de la Publicidad, Impactos en el Currículo y en su Concepción Epistemológica. Doctor Bruno Pompeo tiene la palabra. El título es un sinónimo de duro, tenaz, invulnerable. Hola Karen, buenas tardes. Yo creo que sería bueno esperar mis, mis otros compañeros, ¿no? Hay otros investigadores que van a entrar ¿no? aquí con, conmigo y con nosotros. Déjame. canto por Colombia de Marta Gómez cuenta una historia triste, gris, con sangre y dolor. Orfandad, niños que crecen sin ver a sus padres y madres que lloran por no poder abrazar a sus hijos. Canta por el joven que sueña para que se amedrente las penas y el odio. Alma con fuerza, almas con fuerza y dignidad es la propuesta de no. esta autora en esta canción. ¿Qué pasa con esto que les he contado? Pues que en ellas encuentro que hay mecanismos propios de las manifestaciones artísticas en estos textos. La primera, el primer mecanismo lo denominé autocrítica. Por ejemplo, recuerden ustedes a la sentada, todo tan parado y yo aquí sentada. Hay, re, hay mecanismos de represión en la que dicen cómo lo mataron a sangre fría y le tiraron tres balazos. Una búsqueda de justicia. Los, los, los protagonistas están proponiendo que la gente sea quien propicie este mecanismo de justicia. Vías de hecho. Las vías de hecho se refieren a aquellas que ejercen la gente para presionar y obtener respuestas a sus demandas. Descalificación del oponente, ustedes han visto cómo en estas canciones se acusa, incluso se le minimiza, se le invalida al oponente. Hay una desinformación en la del grito, dice el protagonista, que si aquella madre Yo 
have here the share screen device here. Do you see this? Ah, screen? yes, 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 yes. And then, but you know, <laughs> Zoom, it it shows your whole screen. So it's if you open it and leave it, you know, it's, maybe it's the best thing, you know, like I'm doing right now. You open the, the presentation, but don't put it in a presenter's mode. And then it's easier, you know what I mean? I think I do. Leave it mi minimized. We say minimized in Portuguese. I don't know if you say that in English too. I totally understand what you're saying. Great. <laughs> so, hi, Karen. Nice to meet you. Hi, nice to meet you too. I see Bruno twice. What's going on? Yeah, that's because I'll try to share my screen on one computer and read the text in the other. So. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. All right. And did you pick your phone up, Carl? No, I'm just waiting for Amazon to pass the door. <laughs> but, um, but my neighbor is supposed to be picking it up. So Ah, great. So we can do you first, then Bruno, then me. Can we yeah. do that? Okay. Yes, yeah. but if there's something weird that happens, you'll know why. <laughs> right? Let me... I, I, I will... And it says one participant can share at a time. So you will share first. Yeah. And then let's just let each other know that, hey, I can see your screen, right? That would help. Because once yeah. the screen is open, I don't know. What what my my friend told me in, in Zoom, you have to do like Google Meet. You have to stop sharing, then the other one can share. That's Perfect. it. Perfect. <laughs> Oh my God! <laughs> no, I just moved to London, so it's just uh, you know trying to get stuff ready for school, getting ready for this presentation, and going to meetings. A lot of stress, but it will be good. I know. Yes, and did you uh, did you qualified already for the PhD? Because you're doing the PhD in London. Uh, yeah. Sometimes I me messed up. I don't know if it's in Ryerson or if it's in London. Oh, London at the Royal College of Art. That's Great. where I'm doing the PhD. Yeah. And then you teach at Westminster. Exactly, and they, they are, are paying. Two. And they're paying for the PhD, so I have to make Great, that's right amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> because you and Bruno, you are like everywhere, you know, like you are in Mexico, you are in London, and then you were in, in Ontario. Canada. So, oh my gosh, you know, and Bruno is teaching in three places, three different universities. So wow. yeah. I will yeah. read what you, you said. That would be yes. easier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the guys are everywhere. <laughs> it must be very tough, Bruno, teaching in three different schools. Yes, yeah, three different schools. You have to Sorry. Yes, teaching in three different schools and having to produce articles and some lectures and books and everything. Life's not easy, especially in, in, in a poor country like ours. Continuamos con este evento académico internacional alrededor de los estudios semióticos. Damos paso a la mesa 3 titulada Semiótica de los Nuevos Lenguajes. Contamos con la presencia de la postdoctora María Codier de Mendoza, coordinadora de esta mesa, con su intervención La Maternidad en la Publicidad, Análisis Cualitativo y Semiótico en San Paulo y Toronto. También en esta mesa están presentes el magíster el magister Carl Winston Jones con su intervención descolonizar la publicidad y el postdoctor Bruno Pompey con su intervención la naturaleza semiótica de la publicidad impactos en el currículo y en el y la concepción epistemológica doctora María Collier tiene la palabra muchas gracias uh, this table will be in English so uh, I'd like to welcome everyone especially Bruno and Carl with us our speakers today it's a pleasure to be here thank you for the International Association for Semiotic Studies this is the second international meeting of young researchers of the International Association for Semiotics Studies we are in room two 
We will discuss semiotics, marketing, and advertising today, and uh, we will approach how each of us have applied semiotics to study advertising. So I'd like to introduce Carl and Bruno, first of all. And Carl is a recognized globally uh, as an authority on advertising. He has been invited to 12 countries to give seminars. He teaches PR and advertising at the University of Westminster in London. His PhD research is at the Royal College of Art, and he works with the decolonizing advertising. Semiotics is his preferred method to investigate meaning in visual communication. He uses art through research as a method to create artworks. His pieces have been shown in galleries and museums in Mexico City, Toronto, London, and other cities. Bruno Pompeu is a PhD in Communication Sciences from the University of Sao Paulo. He's a professor of advertising in undergraduate courses at the School of Communication and Arts of the University of Sao Paulo and at the Superior School of Advertising and Marketing, ASCPM in Sao Paulo. He's the author of the books, Semio Publicidade Inovação no Ensino, which would be Samuel Advertising Innovation in Teaching, resulting from his PhD thesis, Technical and Critical Dictionary of Advertising, Dicionario Técnico e Crítico da Comunicação Publicitária, and Where Does Advertising Come From? Where is it now and where is it going? De onde vem, onde está e para onde vai a publicidade? Recently published. As a semiotician consultant, He's one of the founding partners of the Casa Semio, Semio House, conducting marketing research in semiotics, developing methods in integration with other research approaches, and have been already worked for advertising agencies, research institutes, and companies from all sectors in different countries. And I am a professor at the communication department of the Federal University of Pernambuco in Recife, Brazil. I was a postdoctoral fellow at the Federal University of Santa Catarina in Brazil. I have a PhD in communication and semiotics from the Catholic University of Sao Paulo, PUC Sao Paulo, and my dissertation explored motherhood in advertising. In 2013, I worked as a CAPIS visiting researcher at York University in Toronto, Canada. My research interests regards applied semiotics, qualitative research, motherhood in advertising, design thinking, social media, digital culture, and consumer culture. So welcome, Carl. Welcome, Bruno. Uh, first of all, I'd like to present, uh, to invite Carl progress. to make his presentation. And we have a question Recording here for stuff. each of us. Carl, how did you apply semiotics to analyze advertising in your PhD research? Let's listen to Carl. You are on mute. Put the phone Great. on. Great, I will Thank answer you. that, Maria. You can see my full screen? Okay. So um, welcome to my pres presentation called um, The Rhetoric of the Image and Myth Creation Through Outdoor Advertising, a Semiotic Analysis. And today, with this PhD research I'm doing at the Royal College of Art, and the title of my PhD research no, no, is, salim, salim is called, guys, can you turn off your microphone? Thank you. It's called Decolonizing Advertising. I will show how I use two semiotic methods to explore the visual representation of the power relationships in Mexico's political economy as expressed through uh, to the advertising and how these relationships can be resisted through the analysis of secondary messaging and further regulation. This Mexican Visual Communications Review investigates the current visual practice and printed expressions of 2D visual communication in Mexico City by focusing on a billboard campaign that was broadcast early 2018 from the luxury Mexican department store Palacio de Hierro. 
First, the 2D advertising is deconstructed through the analysis of advertising tools and techniques supported through semiotic and design theory. This is followed by a semiotic analysis influenced by various semioticians such as Roland Barthes' application of Susurian semiotic theory applied to popular visual culture and rhetoric of the image. Then uh, Danesi's observation on media semiotics, Harrison, Jewett and Romico on visual social semiotics and Stuart Hall's observations on audiences through encoding and decoding. The objective of this analysis is to discover the primary and secondary messaging broadcast by the advertising to the consumer and map how the messaging is constructed through the application of advertising tools and techniques. But first, let me define advertising. Advertising is a designed communication that reinterprets signs and symbols in order to persuade. And decolonizing uh, is uh, or involves removing or rewriting rules and concepts left by colonial era thinking that still control or influence society. And I propose that advertising messages reinforce these social and cultural values through myth creation. This study was completed or conducted within Mexico's capitalist economy with branded messages that were broadcast in 2018 on Mexican privately owned outdoor media. The brand selected represents a company, Palacio Diero, owned by one of the ruling Mexican families called Bayares. The original campaign consisted of five billboards, various magazine and newspaper ads, along with television and radio ads. The same messages, models, and themes were used in all medias. For this study, I looked at five ads from the billboard campaign and will include a focus on one of the ads that I will call Freckles. The ads were placed in various medias and the purpose of this research, I will examine the outdoor through the analysis of the advertising tools and techniques used to create them, followed by a visual semiotic analysis. This is to understand how the ads are constructed using advertising tools and techniques, and then to understand how the consumer perceives the advertising. And I ask, how can the application of decolonized tools and techniques resist the racist spectacle in Mexican advertising? Here, you can see that I create, I did a chart and I created a code of each of the different tools and techniques, and then I define them. And then uh, I, I apply that to each of the billboards in question. So here's an example of what I've done. And in the table, I've listed the different tools and gave them an explanation. And then here we see other terms that I've done, which is printing, size, layout, structure, um, a brand message gaze, the main image, you know, uh, different things like that. And um, now what I'm going to do is briefly show one analysis so that you understand the process that I've done. And then the other details will be available when this research is published. So let's look at typography, which assists the brand name in projecting an image that the consumer will not confuse with another. This is formed through typeface selection and the arrangement of letters. And then what I did is I applied two of Canadian typographer Carl Dare's theories. One was contrast of size and the other was contrast of color. And here I did an analysis of the headline, the subhead typography by focusing on the color, size, shape, placement, and proportions of the various fonts. Then I examined the logo typography and how it's made up of a serif script. And this remits a classic image that appears to be hand drawn. The art of calligraphy was practiced by the ruling class in New Spain when creating and signing documents, and the logo remits this time period. There is more to say on this, but I don't have time to explain in detail, but I'm assuming that you understand the process. So the tools and techniques of gaze, main image, narratives, typography, brand, text, among others, reveal how a branded myth can be constructed repeated over time in various media to support what Roland Barthes states as how the denoted message naturalizes the connoted message. 
In the next section, I will use visual semiotic analysis to explore how advertising projects two messages. The one the client pays for, for a secondary message that supports branded, cultural, and historic myths. Advertising messages are designed to broadcast a specific message. However, many contain a second level of communication, often promoting racial inequality ideology or gender bias. The following semiotic analysis is of the primary and secondary messaging that appears within this campaign. The main messages delivered by the client to the audience when looking at the billboard campaign is that totally Palacio collections are available at the diverse Palacio the Era store. This message is supported through the central idea of the campaign that represents diversity by featuring a different stereotype in each ad old age, unconventional beauty, androgyny, and overweight. As reported in the Mexican press at the launch of the campaign, Palacio de Hierro wants to break stereotypes and promote diversity. And this message is what the brand and the ad agency want to be interpreted by the viewers of the campaign. Unfortunately, the main issue of diversity is not reflected in the ads by the fact that all the models are white and do not feature anyone who represents 90% of the Mexican population. The ad shows only white models representing 10% of the total population and no racial diversity is presented. The secondary messaging reveals a more complicated relationship between the brand and the Mexican population. This analysis is performed using uh, visual social semiotics and was defined by Jewett and Oyama as a description of semiotic resources, what can be said and done with images and other visual means of communication, and how the things people say and do with images can be interpreted. And this method can be applied to discover the secondary meanings in the billboard campaign, as this is a useful tool for analyzing images and their relationships to text. To support the theory element, which I've just basically explained, I also performed photo elicitation with Mexicans from different classes and racial backgrounds. Each interview was approximately 30 minutes long, and the individual ads were shown to them to elicit their opinions on the advertising and its messaging. This was to see if their opinions supported the theoretical conclusions that I did, and yes, uh, they did, basically. So it's a great way to sort of support my theory. In the Palacio billboards, the intended audience will interpret the message as the advertising agency and its client intended the message to be portrayed. In this case, the ad is directed to people from a high social economic class with a disposable income that enables them to buy the products advertised by Palacio Liero. These receivers will interpret the ad from a dominant hegemonic position, meaning El Palacio Liero supports stereotypes of gender, beauty, age, weight, but they all have to be encased in a white skin. According to Stuart Hall, there are audiences who will decode the message differently than what it was intended. This is a negotiated position. Hall defines it as the audience that understands the text codes and mostly accepts the general meaning, but at the same time resisting and modifying the message so that it reflects their own life experiences and cultural backgrounds. However, Hall's third position, called oppositional, would be seen by lower socioeconomic audiences that cannot afford these types of clothes or accessories. They will interpret the message as these clothes are for richer white people. This is because people with darker skin in Mexico are not featured in the ads. So there is no one for the target to identify with. This form of emitting or erasure is discussed by Bonaventura de Sousa Santos in his 2018 book, The End of the Cognitive Empire, with his concept called sociology of absences and is touched upon by Audrey Lords in their uh, 2018 influential article, The Master's Tools Will Never Dismant Dismantle the Master's House. So to conclude, I use two methods to analyze the campaign tools and techniques and a traditional semiotic uh, study. This is to understand how the ads are constructed and then to understand how the consumer reacts to the advertising. The anti-stereotypes billboard campaign from Palacio de Hierro is a constructed visual communication designed through the application of various advertising tools and techniques. 
This advertising campaign also broadcasts two messages, a main message and a secondary message. The second level of messaging confronts the economically challenged viewer with the harsher realities of life in Mexico by presenting designer commodities that only the wealthy can afford. Although the ads celebrate diversity, it is only a white diversity and does not recognize the diversity of other 90% of the population. The advertisements also are important through what they do not show, which are people of color, and this reinforces the concept of erasure where what is not shown is forgotten. The ads can also be considered a contemporary version of Las Pinturas de Castas that still classify Mexicans, with the wider ruling class presented in the position of power. In this case, we have a constructed 2D visual communication depicting wealthy white citizens wearing luxury goods. The Palacio de Hierro ads are a contemporary visual form that reflects colonial thinking. By applying advertising tools and techniques to encode brands, we can observe how and why brand meaning is constructed to create a brand revealing that the tools and techniques of typography, gaze, main image, narrative, and others demonstrate how a branded myth can be constructed to develop strategies of power and how cultural meaning are filtered and encoded through the advertising process. The encoding process demonstrates advertising ideological power where ad agencies or institutions where cultural creativity and commercial business objectives coexist and collide with the discourses of capitalism and culture become enmeshed and intertwined. This is why we need to decolonize advertising. This semiotic analysis concludes that the cultural history cultivated by the ruling families is unconsciously maintained through messages that portray values that indirectly reinforce their class power. In this case, a myth that is defined by the way it utters its message, where the message is broadcast through paid mass media reflecting the social and cultural values created over 500 years ago that are now so ingrained in Mexican society that they are not questioned and a part of the construction of modern Mexico. The power representations that are presented through 2D advertising is the cultivated myth of the light-skinned ruling class. This translates into advertising that mostly features light-skinned actors, creating a myth that white is better and therefore aspirational to consumers, leading to the discussion on why advertising now needs to be decolonized. Thank you very much for the opportunity. This is the bibliography that I have for the presentation and for the photo elicitation that I just showed you. And if you're interested, this is my social media channels. So you can take a screenshot now and then follow me on Twitter. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carl. It was really good and the timing was perfect. <laughs> so now we are going to listen to Bruno's presentation. And I'd like to ask Bruno the same question, which is, how did you apply semiotics to analyze advertising in your PhD research, Bruno? <laughs> Hi, thank you, Maria. Congratulations, Carl. Well, uh, sorry for my form poor English. Sometimes it's not easy to find the correct word for our ideas or for our concepts. But first of all, I'd like to thank you for the valuable opportunity of being here today debating a subject so important and sometimes so little explored, which is the approach of the semiotic theory with advertising. Therefore, I thank the organizers for the invitation and also who are present here today with us. I hope that with my brief speech, I can be contributing to the debates and in some way encouraging other researchers to follow our trajectory. My speech today is directed to you. My first contact with semiotics was in 2004 when I was close to finish my undergraduate course in advertising at University of Sao Paulo. I had already studied some authors related to language throughout the course, just like Bakhtin, Saussure, for example, but it was at the time uh, of writing my final work, Monograph, that I got to know Peirce semiotics. It was Professor Clotilde Pérez who first referred me to a book by Lucia Santaella, Applied Semiotics or Semiotica Aplicada. And since then, I have never stopped reading about semiotics. To tell the truth, since then, I have never been able to see life, the world, and reality from any other perspective than the one proposed by the so-called Persian epistemology. Uh, 
As they say, you don't choose semiotics. You let yourself be carried away by it. Then came the master's degree, and looking to learn a little more about first semiotics, I dedicated myself to doing semiotic analysis of long play album covers. I chose the covers of a very important Brazilian artist called Dorival Caymmi. My original intention was to exercise my ability to analyze and interpret, exploring Peirce triads, categories of signs, etc. But semiotics is so powerful that, as I identified the potential meaning, the potential meaning effects obtained by the covers, these covers, and confronted those covers' meanings with the musical content of the albums, an expected hypothesis emerged. At the time, I still didn't know the part of Peirce's work that talks about abductive reasoning, which perhaps would have been helpful. Anyway, with this hypothesis pulsating in my head, I faced the field work and discovered what no one knew, not even Dorival Caymmi's granddaughter, which, uh, who is the author of his biography and who is a researcher dedicated to his work. I discovered that it was Caymmi himself, composer and singer, but also a painter uh, who defined the aesthetic elements that made up the covers of his albums. And so with this discovery, I no longer had any way to go back. Already completely given over to semiotics, I only had the PhD. As I was also teaching at that time, I became interested in educational issues, in teaching and advertising in higher education. There was for me, in the formation of advertising, something incomplete or insufficient. It wasn't about teaching methods. It didn't have to do with teacher training either. It became clear to me that the issue was structural, deep, epistemological. And so I decided to study the curricula of advertising courses, understanding this curricula as an instrument of articulation between the theoretical basis of advertising, an, an epistemological dimension, and the teaching of a professional practice, a technical dimension. So to verify which was the predominant concept of advertising in Brazilian universities, I worked with three basic methodologies. First, a bibliographical review, seeking to understand the history of higher education courses in Brazil, the main theories of, of the curriculum, the history of advertising courses at the, in Brazil, and the history of the development of the theoretical field of research in advertising in our country. Next, a documentary analysis of the legislation. I did a documentary analysis of the legislation that regulates higher education courses in our country uh, with special attention to the national guidelines that serve as the basis for the curricula of the university. And finally, we did semiotic analysis of institutions curricula. We selected 10 universities with different profiles. Uh, large private, mass private, confessional universities, state public universities, federal public uh, universities, new courses, traditional courses, old courses, etc. Uh, 10 different universities. And we analyze the titles of the components of the curricula and their program content. Uh, this stage of the research revealed a specific understanding of what advertising is, closely linked to a theoretical tradition in social sciences, a vision that defined advertising as something unidirectional and linear. In that type, typical conception of functionalist theories of communication from the beginning of the 20th century, the research found that the curricula and subjects, therefore, the training in advertising itself neglected the issue of the language and the production of meaning. More than that, all the possibilities to understand advertising in a deeper, more complex and broader way 
were combined in theoretical subjects without any possibility of dialogue with other components of the curriculum. It became clear that an, that an epistemological reveal of advertising was needed, seeking to understand it from another point of view, and at the same time, a new curricular proposal, which would favor the formation of more prepared advertisers, advertisers precisely from the articulation of language theories, semiotics in this case, of course, with contextual issues and the professional practice of advertising. This is how semiotics once again proved to be powerful. Using Peirce's tri triadic notion of design, I proposed a curricular structure model uh, that escaped the usual two-dimensional logic which which organizes contents by semesters or years and days of the week. First, at the epistemological level, relating foundation, context, and execution, we seek to establish the deepest conceptual basis that will define a specific and comprehensive vision of what advertising is at the same time. In the foundation, in the foundation dimension, we have communication. In the context dimension, we have consumption, consum consumers, society. And in the dimension of execution, we have semiotics concerning about the generation of meaning. Then at a level above the theoretical level, we present, through, uh, we present thoughts that could update, expand, and somehow concretize the epistemological basis in theory. In the dimension of communication foundation, we consider, for example, discussions about mediation, circulation, etc. Current discussions about communication. In the context of consumption, in the context consumption dimension, we propose the views of anthropology, sociology, and philosophy uh, of consumption. And in the semiotics execution dimension, we consider language theories, sign theories, semiotics itself, for example. Finally, on a level above, at the practical level, we would have an even more concrete vision of formation in advertising corresponding to the communication foundation dimension. We would have the advertising message. In this dimension, languages, codes, texts, images, etc., will be studied. Corresponding to the consumption context dimension, we will have contents linked to what advertising offers, such as the product, strategy, marketing, economy, etc. And corresponding to the semiotic execution dimension, we will have the contents linked to the intended meanings, brand, positioning, conceptualization, values, etc. The combination of these three levels with their three interrelated dimensions allows a visualization of teaching in advertising that breaks with the linear and Cartesian logic of traditional curricula. Another contribution is the prediction of disciplinary links between levels and between dimensions, favoring theory, practice, integration. Anyway, friends, there would be much more to talk about, but time is short. I would just like to finish by saying that this story does not end here. Just yesterday, mm -hmm. I received my new book, which is here with me, my new book <laughs> at home, which is the result from my post postdoc research. It's no longer about doing semiotic analysis or, think, or thinking about proposals based on per triadic notion of the sign. In the book, I propose an understanding of advertising based on its sign nature and its condition of language. More than to its form or to its content, we need to pay attention to the language of advertising. Today, views on advertising that privilege its contents, its strategic function, function and its media process dominate we need to rescue a vision that conceives advertising as a language, as having a signic nature. Nowadays, when digital communication technologies offer so many possibilities and so many challenges to the practice of advertising, language is an antidote, as Santa Ella says, 
against these incomplete visions. Only the language point of view will allow us to have a full understanding of how advertising operates in our current context. It's the language that shows, uh, that shows us, for example, that advertisements can have at the same time an apparently edifying content within a radically perverse message. That's what we see sometimes in cost advertising, for example. It's the language that reveals to us, for example, that as much as the media today tends towards invisibility, the mediating function, which is a function of the sign by definition, continues to exist, and it often produces meaning, meaning effects that end up being ignored. Semiotics, at least in my perspective, uh, semiotics, at least in my opinion, is the theoretical framework that best equips us to assume this perspective of language and with it make a kind of advertising that effectively participates in the construction of a better society, one that does not give up on pursuing the growth of concrete reasonableness. Thank you very much. Thank you, it was perfect. You guys are great on timing. Let me check if I can do it too. <laughs> Uh, I will share my screen and, and show you how did I work with advertising in my PhD now. Very interesting presentations. Thank you, Bruno. Thank you, Carl. So can you see my screen? Is it okay? Yes, yes, it's great. Okay, so let me check something. This is better. So uh, let me put the first one. My PhD project is entitled Motherhood in Advertising. A semiotic, a qualitative and semiotic analysis in Brazil and Canada. So, in my PhD research, I argued that advertising reproduces and reinforces culturally constructed maternal ideals. My research issues were what meanings are associated with being a mother today? What maternal ideals are predominant within advertising messages and imagery? and how mothers and pregnant women negotiate these advertising signs. The research methods and steps included qualitative research with mothers in Toronto and Sao Paulo, then the semiotic analysis of advertising. In Brazil, it was a larger period from 2006 to 2013, and in Canada from 2010 to 2013. Then I came back to Brazil and did a comparative analysis. And meanwhile, I was doing the three phases. I did a literature review on motherhood studies and on communication studies and semiotics as well. So um, the research methods basically included these three steps. I worked with semiotic, per person semiotics and psychoanalytic concepts. We have the psychoanalytic semiotics at the Catholic University of Sao Paulo, and my supervisor was Professor Oscar Cesarotto. And Lucia Santaella participated a lot with very important advice. And then I did the qualitative research with mothers and pregnant women. And in Canada, I had a co-advisor that was a specialist on motherhood studies, Professor Andrea O'Reilly from York University. I interviewed pregnant women and mothers with children up to eight years of age in Toronto and in Sao Paulo. And I explored how they perceived themselves as mothers, what it means to be a mother, a mother or to be pregnant for them, and what they thought about the advertising. It's important to say I analyzed specific type of campaigns that were print advertising published in parenting magazines from Brazil and from Canada. Today, I will talk about the meanings of being a mother in Sao Paulo and in Toronto. And I will show the thematic groups of advertising campaigns, highlighting the results from Brazil because I don't have time to talk about Canada. Then I will sum up the key findings of this research. So uh, in general, when we talk about uh, how mothers feel. There were three phases that was different feelings that came up. 
when they were pregnant, especially in the first pregnancy, it was a lot of expectation, insecurity. They were emotionally sensitive. They, they feel their body and psychological changes very intensely experienced. And the idea of, will I be able to manage the creating a baby or being a mother was a very frequent question. So lots of interrogation marks. When the kids were born in the first year of, preg of, of the baby's life, it was a survival period, you know, between mother and kid. Uh, and then the surprise about nobody told me it was so hard to be a mother. So they did not sleep. They had lots of work to do, including house tasks and taking care of the baby. Uh, there was a sort of mother-baby symbiosis and this relational bond very intense. So they talked about breastfeeding and how hard it was being every time available. And then there was also the good experience of daily discoveries and progresses. Like, for example, the baby is now making a new sound, smiling in a different way or starting to move differently and starting to say the first words and so on. And then after one year to eight years of age, they start um, participating in the social life. And then mothers start juggling. So they were returned to work. They face different challenges in dealing with several roles. And then they say it's all about balance. However, this balance is never possible. So the experience comes and give them a more mature look about their work, their identity, their lifestyle, their priorities of life change. They review lots of things they thought before being a mother and now. And then children and family open up to the outside world, despite they complain a lot of feeling overwhelmed and very exhausted about this whole, of, this whole bunch of things that motherhood includes. So the semiotic analysis, uh, I would talk about this a little bit. Uh, the advertising analysis aimed at identifying thematic groups in Brazil and in Canada with similar characteristics, referring to maternal representations, images, messages, and cultural values. I use the book, the same book as Bruno was telling about, that's uh, Applied Semiotics from Santa Ela. I use another book that is uh, Estrategias Semióticas da Publicidade, uh, it would be in English, semiotic, uh, advertising strategic semiotics from Santa Ella in it, and some books from Clotilde Pérez as well, and uh, psychoanalytic semiotics, followed by some, uh, Cesar Ot, who was my supervisor. Then I studied communication and consumption and motherhood studies. So uh, what basically I tried to map Typical and recurrent aspects in verbal and visual languages of the ads related to images, messages, and cultural ideals and values. Uh, specific ways in which the signs were expressed and also explore the suggestive, indicative, and representative power of the signs and their connections with the objects to which they were related or represented. Then I list those similarities. Uh, which were connected with symbolic and general aspects. It's important to say while in Brazil, the advertising map followed to image as key criteria due to stronger connections with the Brazilian collective imaginary and cultural codes. In Canada, what got mother the mother's attentions were the advertising strategies and messages. I mean, how to mother, it called the attentions of the women I interviewed in the qualitative research phase. So uh, basically, uh, as in the qualitative research phase, women talked a lot about images in Brazil, while the Canadian women talked about the strategies and how the discourse of advertising was built, I did different mappings based on what I learned from them in the qualitative research phase. This mapping did not came out of my mind because I like to, to do it like this. It came up in this way because that's what I learned from these women I interviewed. So in Brazil, the four groups, I will just show very important characteristics as a summing up what I learned 
from them. These are two ads from these groups. The one we can talk about, for example, what were the recurrent characteristics, for example, in Brazil, expectation and worry, the physical and psychological transformations were highlighted. The magic discourse is about the diving grace of generating a baby and giving birth requires donation and passivity. The Christian values. So the mother should be passive, pure, and dedicated in reminding the Virgin Mary and the Catholic ideals of motherhood. Pregnant women were shown in static poses with their hands on the wombs, waiting for the greatest moment of the baby birth, like sacred eggs. So there was a, there was a very strong contrast. If you look at the advertising of non-maternal women, when they portray non-maternal women, they were sexy, independent, dynamic, but when they portrayed the pregnant women, they came up very passive and very static. The messages were addressed to the would-be future buyer, for example, the transformation of their selves and their lives by purchasing a product. And then the focus of images were very uh, strongly uh, focusing the bellies. There were lots of bellies of women without heads, just this generic body like this one, for example, that the product itself reminds the body shape. Like what it says, well, you care for a new life while we care for you. And then the second group that was the majority of ads that I mapped in Brazil, they showed images of mothers and baby expressing happiness, togetherness, and peace and bond and harmony. Mothers were totally available to care for the babies, but in real life, Brazilian mothers must return to work feeling guilty about leaving their children with other people, according to what I have learned from the qualitative research. So this type of full-time availability, I found out it was a real ideal conditions in tune with the Christian values of purity and dedication. So the messages of protection, safety, comfort, care, bonding, and affections were very recurrent, and the products were inserted in this mother-baby symbiosis. And then uh, when you look at the ad, for example, the brand itself uh, put itself inside the dead mother and baby. For example, Johnson's put this um, symbol of when you are born, you put this waist bracelet and the maternity and then they put the brand's name inside it if you see there johnson's baby instead of the name of the mother in the kid so when a baby is born a mother is born too and she does everything she can to avoid baby stares and then natura says natura invites you to see what's unique in the most varied stories between mothers and baby the fundamental loves the brand itself takes it takes for it the maternal love. That was very impressive. So the imperfections of everyday difficulties were not shown. Brands were associated with this reaffirmation of maternal tenderness, care, and protection towards the child. Besides the products, extra doses of maternal love and tranquility were included in the messages. The third group was really small. Only ads from the Father's Day were shown in Brazil, very few campaigns. And then when the father came up to the scene, it was always a hidden picture, you know, behind the mother or, you know, like showing their necks. Uh, it was impressive how they did not have space in these images. And then when brands and products integrate the father to the communication, they tend to keep mothers in focus since women are their key target market. So most brands do not speak directly or exclusively to fathers. Finally, there was a fourth group with other resources and the messages were conveyed to maternal performers. For example, Corolla, that's a car from Toyota says, the Corolla field is perfect to your daily routine. Take the children to the school, go to work, go to the gym and enjoy the weekend. And then what the women I interviewed said, it sells the image of a Wonder Woman. She works, goes to the gym. She's a slim and attractive woman, a materialistic and a consumerist woman. She should have two nannies. 
the beautiful landscape and the wonderful beach house in the background also indicate status, success, and sophistication. So the main selling appeals of Group 4 uh, conveyed to the, mom, the elastic mom ideal that I work on my thesis. Brands and products are expert, experts on motherhood. They talk with women in an instructive speech. They show how to do it. They are associated with better performance maternal ideals. And they focus on products, functional attributes and benefits and conveying to good the good adequate mothering that pre is prevalent in the culture. And then uh, they try to give support to the mothers, uh, telling them they should support the child's growth and playing experience. So this elastic mother synthesized the accumulations of maternal ideals within advertising and media representation. They show at, you know, an accumulation of ideal that's not feasible to perform. They should be at, at the same time dedicated mothers and spouses, but also well-informed, successful in their careers, keep good shape, keep calm, dynamic and flexible. So that was my criticism. And key learnings to finalize, Advertising reinforces the dominant culture of motherhood. Most, me most messages are aimed at meeting the insecurities of pregnant women and mothers of babies. Many campaigns depict mothers and babies in poses of warmth and harmony. Fathers are not frequent in these scenes. The claims are connected to cultural values such as being successful, fast, safe, clean, and bacteria-free. But advertising also connects to idealized worlds of, co of or context, for example, the green, the natural, the healthy, the balanced and peaceful. Women are encouraged to be dedicated spouses and mothers falling to this impossible ideal of the elastic mother. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Bruno and Carl. And also I'd like to thank my advisors, uh, Oscar and Andrea. So now we finish. I don't know if we have questions already. Uh, there are no questions in the chat. Okay, so now we can talk about. Uh, I, I have a question I'd like to start. I'd like to ask Bruno and Carl because the three of us, we worked previously with advertising. So the question is, how your previous or current professional experience with advertising has interact, interacted with your academic journey with the semiotics of advertising. Bruno, do you want to go? No, you go first, please. Okay. <laughs> okay, thanks Maria for that. And Bruno, the presentation is very interesting and I'm very excited that there are other people with the passion uh, for advertising and understanding it using semiotic theory. I think it's great. And uh, what you guys showed are just other ways of applying uh, theory to understanding advertising. So um, I come from an art director background and uh, I was an art director, creative director in various agencies in Mexico and Canada. And I didn't discover semiotics until I was doing my master's in Toronto uh, like eight years ago. And when I discovered it, I, a light went off and I just found it amazing that there was this uh, research method that I could use as a creative to inspire and also guide my uh, advertising messaging creation. And it also gives me reasons to also sell the advertising to my clients. So what I was able to do, understanding semiotics in my career as an art director, was that I was able now to encode my advertising messages. So I know in semiotics, we use a lot of uh, decoding to understand what the messaging is about. And, and, and what I am doing now is that I use semiotics to encode my advertising with specific signs and symbols that I know will appeal to the target market and also reflect the brand that I'm advertising. And I think it 
allows me to create more effective advertising and more targeted advertising creative. And it also creates more original visual communication where I can play with various signs and symbols to create codes that I think are easier for the consumer to sort of understand. And I think it makes the advertising messaging more targeted. So that's how I would answer your question, Maria. Does that make sense? Yes, I was thinking about my, my postdoctoral research that I studied with semiotics and design thinking, and it makes a lot of sense because I agree with you, like in my PhD, I just look at the decoding process. But then when I went to the postdoctoral research, I was connected to designers, and then I needed to understand the creative process as a complementary process to the semiotic Mm -hmm. um you know analysis so i think they work very well together and i think that's exactly what bruno does when he does the projects for clients at casa casa semi if could you please talk about this bruno yes yes sure uh it's interesting for me to uh, uh being together with people that think the same way works work with the same things uh, it's always very good well but Trying to answer this question, I think the distance between the university and companies and companies and, and brands is something that needs to be faced very diligently and very carefully. And this is our daily struggle in Casa Semio. Of course, we are all teachers, researchers, and at the same time, we are consultants. We work with brands, with companies. Uh, on the one hand, work in the market stimulates theoretical reflection. The, the, the challenges that the brands uh, show to us, they stimulate our reflection. On the other hand, uh, scientific research feels uh, a, a dipping on brand practices or a dipping uh, of practice of the brands of the companies. But honestly, I don't think uh, I, uh, I don't think I would see much sense in going uh, one path without having this intersection with the other path. Uh, for me, the, these two things must be always together. It's not about conditioning scientific production directly to the interest of the market, of course. But to understand, uh, but I think the, 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 the point is we have to understand that universities function is to effectively train citizens who in their work, working as advertisers, can transform the market and the society. That's how I think. Very interesting because that's what in I think that my research and Carl's research has a very common point. Like we have a, we are trying to deconstruct stereotypes. While I worked with motherhood, he worked with um, racial issues, right? In Mexico, to, when he talks about decolonizing advertising, and I talk about motherhood in advertising, we are talking about very similar subjects that is how advertising has been uh, producing stereotypes and exclusion, right? And, or maybe in the case of mothers, it also uh, reinforces an impossible model of mothering that makes women feel guilty. You know, like this idea of being a bad mother because I can't reach that ideal. I can't be so happy as the mother shown on Johnson's baby's ad. You know, I'm not always smiling or always happy about, you know, it, it's not easy. And I'm not, I'm not always here because I need to work as well. So I think these are very interesting and relevant points yeah. when we think about being professors as well. You know, like to talk to our students yeah. about our role in the market. Right? Yeah, yeah, I'm sure about it. And, and let me say something uh, because I think we three work with the same thing because in my book, uh, I say this, uh, exactly this, the same advertising that seduces is the advertising that frustrates. These two things come together, frustration and, and, and very bad feelings they can produce. At the same time, they stimulate, this, they say, uh, advertising seduces, stimulates, uh, ask us for, uh, for buying and, and, and invites us to be happy, but at the same time, it produces lots of frustration in people. But I think we have one question, sorry. 
Yeah, I, I read it, but I did not really understood. It says, uh, what signs you can discover in their studies with respect to any brand speeches? For example, sim symbols, icons. Yeah, maybe uh, I think they want to know how do we do our work, right? With semiotics. What? Because there, are, I think there is one good way of answering to that. Sometimes we can um, deep dive into one sign specifically, maybe a logo or one specific campaign, or, and other times we can do mappings. Like as I did in my research, I did the mapping of a, a theme that was motherhood in advertising, and I could uh, see what were recurrent symbols, signs, or you know, icons, how the mothers were portrayed in advertising. This is a, a how can I say it? A, it's not a zoom in, right? But we also can do a zoom in, for example, if you wanna analyze how a brand expresses itself. For example, you are building a brand identity. You are building a new logo and then it has graphic elements and you want to understand how people will understand these signs. So you can analyze typography, you can analyze packaging, you can analyze visual uh, symbols that comes together with the logo and things like that. So there are lots of possibilities. I think the, this idea of zoom in and zoom out is one possibility that is very didactic to explain, right? And what, what else can we say, Bruno and Carl? <laughs> well, um, I, I would say that using this, the method I was talking about, the advertising tools and techniques. So what I've done is deconstruct advertising and understand how it was constructed using the methods that we use in advertising. So we do use typography, we do use photography, we do use printing, we do use media, we do use the gaze, which is a, a media studies theory. We do use illustration or photography. And so on top of doing a semiotic analysis, what I like to do is also look at how the actual message is constructed. And of course, I was focusing on 2D uh, advertising. Uh, if you're looking at the moving image, there would be other techniques like audio and how sound and music were used and also time. Um, but I think uh, that is sort of something that I've created to help me to complement the typical way that we analyze, sem uh, we semiotically analyze advertising. I wanted to look at another level, which was the actual tools and techniques used to construct these myths that advertising and branding do, because they are stories that a brand wants to tell and they're not real. I mean, they're fake. It's storytelling, mm -hmm. it's a fake narrative that benefits usually a capitalist corporation in convincing consumers to either part with their money or to believe in the certain ideology if advertising is used for political purposes, for example. And advertising can be used in capitalism, it can be used in socialism, it can be used in communism uh, and uh, fascism. Advertising is used in all different types of ideologies. It's not just used to sell products like Coca-Cola. Anyway, that would be my answer to your question. Mm -hmm. And you, okay. Bruno? Yeah, one, uh, 30 seconds. Uh, perhaps for me, the greatest contribution of semiotics, at least per semiotics, is the combination of a theoretical basis with its own methodological procedures. These two things are together in semiotics. So you can understand the signs and find them, identify them in, 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 a, in an ad, for example. That's it. I think, I, I think we don't have more time. Yeah, I was looking at the time. I think we should finish at, I mean, in one minute, right? Wow, <laughs> we, I would spend one hour talking more. <laughs> with oh you. yeah, it's been very definitely. nice. Definitely. We should get together again. <laughs> definitely, this time so, physically in one place. Yes, yeah, true. Yeah, that would be great. So I think uh, we need to finish the session. And I'd like to thank for uh, Dr. Neila Pado and Bianca that has invited us to be part of this semiotic meeting. It's a pleasure to be here with Bruno, with Carl. I think 
I hope you liked the discussion as like as much as I did. And I hope we can continue talking about semiotics of advertising in the near future. So it's a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you very much, everybody. And, and have a good day. Good day. Have a good af uh, afternoon, right? Yes. Yeah. Because Evening. already at night, maybe. Yes, Evening. Yes. Thank you very much. Very <laughs> Thank exciting. You very Bye, much. everyone. Bye, guys. See you soon. Bye. -bye. Bye. Gracias, postdoctora María Collier, magíster Carl Winston Jones y postdoctor Bruno Pompeu por sus aportes y tiempo. También a los espectadores por su participación activa con preguntas a través de los chats habilitados durante los en vivo. Muchas gracias a los ponentes y espectadores por participar. Nuevamente agradecemos a los organizadores, apoyo y al equipo técnico haciendo viable esta transmisión y evento académico. También gracias a todos quienes nos acompañaron durante el en vivo a través del Facebook y YouTube. Recuerden compartir estas transmisiones y así llegar a más personas. Para seguir enterados de cada en vivo, no olviden dar clic en el botón seguir o suscribirse activando la función de notificaciones. Nos vemos el siguiente sábado 2 de octubre en la sala 2 de 10 de la mañana a 12 del día para ahondar sobre semiótica y movimientos sociales y semiótica y escenarios emergentes. Gracias.